came in here and there were pants everywhere. Like the uh, spin weights were taking a long time to load. Huh, I didn't see that on this time. We have the best glitches. All right, well, might as well go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see, updates on viewer stuff. Uh, materials work continues apace. I think uh, Dave probably talk about that in a minute. Um, inventory thumbnails work is coming along nicely. Uh, don't have all the pieces yet, but we are making good progress. Um, so that's going to entail some new inventory UI for like a single folder view as well as uh, letting you see the the uh, thumbnails themselves for for items that have those defined. Um, and our upcoming next upcoming viewer release should be crossed fingers again for however many times it's been the uh, performance floater viewer. Um, so that's the one that has the automatic uh, FPS controls and the new Loader that lets you tune uh, various performance related options uh, more easily and also has the move to VS 2022 so that will take us into the uh, next era of Visual Studio uh, when we do that. Uh, let's see other stuff going on uh, wanted to mention we're we're poking around with our um, uh, repo settings a little bit. We've been having pull requests all going into the same branch, which has caused some uh, glitches in the past. Um, I think we're going to change that so that it, the PRs will be against main, which actually doesn't get updated except when a new viewer is promoted. So then each PR will actually need to be moved into its correct destination. But um, the basic problem is that the correct destination varies from, um, you know, varies from PR to PR. So trying to have sort of a one one target fits all wasn't really working out very well for us. Uh, let's see. I don't know if we've gotten to part to anything about breaking utterly yet. Um, no, Bex is something about breaking utterly. Uh, what is the break center? Really? I didn't get that either. Oh, the performance floater? Oh, well, that's all right. They're not going to ship it without fixing it. Are they? Um, let's see. What else is going on? Uh, da, 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 da. No, I think that's it. Uh, let's see. Ryder, anything new in uh, Observer Land coming up? Uh, no, not nothing to report today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk about uh, state of materials? Sure. Yep. And yeah, fixing the instrumentation is what we get for missing the race to release. Uh, losing the race to release. Uh, so yeah, that's that's coming along. Um, much thanks to everybody in the Discord for pointing out the things that keep getting not quite right. Um, so that that's really kicking off. That's been really helpful. Um, I think the last remaining thing there. I say this every week, but I think the last remaining thing there is to figure out what's going on with uh, one of the texture coordinate issues. Um, go figure OpenGL and is weird, and what it thinks zero zero means in a texture coordinate. Um, but yeah, I hope to have that out there eminently. I'm kind of curious what people's plans are as far as adoption schedules. Uh, as you know, it's not really out there until um, it's on the third-party viewers. Uh, uh, and I, I get that there will be a lot of wait and see when it's NRC to see what happens before messing with it too much. But exciting times.
I'm not sure if I understand the question, Beck. Uh, performance floater is in RFC now, so the plan is that it'll be the next one we promote. And the texture floater will not be integrated into the edit floater. Um, as there's just there's no room. And the whole like, hey, let's let's switch tabs, but it's not really tabs; it's a radio button. Um, that's kind of horrible. <laughs> yeah, I suspect that, that PBR isn't actually merged with uh, the performance floater yet since the performance floater hasn't been promoted, so... Right. Once so, they what? go into merge mode next, probably next week, if we get that out when we're hoping to, um, then uh, at that point they'll be able to take fixes. Yep, and as soon as that goes to main, then we'll pull main to the 559 branch. Um, and then any regressions from uh, materials changes versus per floater changes will will be fair game for bugification and fixing. But I haven't taken a look at it yet, but the uh and the GLTF floater sorry in the GLTF uh viewer um the shadow draw calls got down to like 100 nanoseconds per draw call on NVIDIA Windows. So if there's instrumentation per draw call, that will probably get bumped to a higher level. And that's, eh. um, yeah, we're really trying to get away from anything that takes up any kind of cache space, like talking about CPU cache space and the name of instrumentation that's rarely on. Yeah. Well, conditional on what? I mean, this is stuff that, uh, this is a feature that we want to have present in the viewer all the time. Yeah, uh, it might just be a refactor where instead of having it conditionally turned on and the, uh, and the loop that goes through all the draw calls, we'd, we'd have a, a fork of the draw call loop that's instrumented and you conditionally go into that fork. Um, and that fork is allowed to be slow but give you detailed profiling information about objects. You could also hang the information that doesn't usually exist in, in some uh, hash table that you can jump to from from the draw info. Yeah. Various options. That it wouldn't be tying up any of your, you know, normal memory when you're not using it. Right. And even with it being user facing, um, if it if it's stuff like I'm going to add a branch per draw call. Uh, I mean I'll profile it and see exactly how much overhead it adds, but if it takes it from like, 
100 nanoseconds per draw call to 120 nanoseconds per draw call, then it's, it's not going to live in the main render loop. Like, we'd have to have, like, a mode when that floater is open where um, there's a fork higher up in the render loop where it says, okay, instead of doing the one that's not instrumented, run the version of the uh, render loop that is instrumented. All right, well, I guess as you can see, we've moved into the general discussion section of the meeting. Uh, what's everybody else up to? Anything new and interesting in uh, TPV releases or anything? New features? put a new release out last week for Genesis 1.4706 really made uh, it was a sort of bug fix but we added a few f new features to it we've we fixed that lost and found on login issue which was appears to be an inherited bug but really helped us with that so we were very grateful all right cool Got a question that you may or may not be able to answer. You know this business with the message history. Um, we we get a lot of people saying it's a bug. I've opened my IM and there's there's a chat. There's half a chat in there. We're wondering, do we need to put a top and tail in it ourselves, saying beginning of chat, end of chat, or, or, or history, or is that something that Lyndon would do to differentiate between that and and, and a current IM? No top. Top of chat for to to indicate what the like where the history stops and the current session begins. Yeah, like um, like uh, beginning of message history, end of message history, or recent history. Purely because people think that it's a bug and that a chat has been opening and they haven't their IM hasn't opened, and when they've looked in on it and they see history, they believe it's a current conversation. So we need to sort of differentiate. We we can do that, um, but we wondered if it's something you wanted to do because other viewers or everyone will have the same issue presumably when it's incorporated. Well, I mean, normally the the historical view, like stuff that you get out of your chat records, is is grayed out. I think as opposed to the you know brighter text for the current stuff. Are we doing that with the with the history? content as well I would, I would think we'd want to do that well it's, it's open to interpretation ours is in italic and, and and bold and in white um but they still don't seem to get the message that it's not that it's you know a new feature not a bug yeah it's kind of it's kind of weird that we still do that um I think if we were going to devote developer resources to it, we'd probably look into just showing the whole chat that showed up when, like for group chat. I haven't tested it out yet, so I'm not sure what it looks like. Uh, Kyle, is you're it, the problem on the is product it, side it, of the house. Any thoughts on that? As, as Tyke was saying, the problem is that uh, people aren't used to it. Because I've seen it in our uh, viewer now. I think it's a bug. I don't think it's normal yet, so they've got to get used to it. Yeah, some of it may just be what people are are used to seeing. Um, but yeah, I would think you'd want to have it, you know, de-emphasized the the history stuff. So, you know, less bold and and uh, you know, darker color and that sort of thing. Yeah, we're we're looking at changing the color of it as well. Just to just to emphasize that it is history and not current chat. Yeah. Definitely makes sense. Like I'm, I'm looking at the uh the Firestorm support group chat and it's like Yeah, I can kinda tell, but it's not obvious at all, is it? 
that's why I wondered if we wanted to put, I mean, we can do it our end. We can put a header and a, and a, you know, and a, and a, a footer behind it. But we wondered if you wanted to do that so that well, it's less good for the viewer, isn't it, really? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we've had any discussions about doing that. But, um, you know, if uh, if people want to send a, the best way to do it is just send a feature request uh, Jira to us and we can kind of hash it out at our regular weekly meeting. Okay, I'll do that, thanks. I'm over here trying to figure out if there's any chat programs out there that don't show group chat history that came in when you weren't there, besides IRC. It's a, it's a great feature. It's a really, really handy feature. It's just that it, you don't necessarily know that it's not current. Yeah, I mean, if that's not clear in the current UI, then we should uh, we should probably look at that. Um, so it's a it's a good point. Yeah, and and on the uh, uncompressed texture thing, um, there wasn't a server side change related to that. Uh, or lossless? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody could be could have been doing that. Um, I mean, if you want to argue for a, a, a project that um, does more vetting of textures that get uploaded and maybe changes the upload fee to encourage people to make use like more size optimal textures. Um, sure, that that might be something to do, uh, but like having a particular texture where you kind of have to reach around your head to scratch your ear to upload anything that isn't a normal map uh, and take advantage of the lossless, <sighs> that's a very small crack next to some very wide open windows. Um, and I, I don't think it's worth delaying uh, the materials release or um, saddling everybody who's using PBR with artifacty normal maps uh, to plug that hole immediately. Yeah, and you really can't, like like in the textures I've tested, unless you really squint, you can't tell the difference in the lossless versus not lossless, except for things like, like normal maps.
there's no low option. There's like what what Beck is talking about is in the uh, GLTF uh, importer. Um, when you import a GLTF file, um, the viewer will upload the normal map uh, with lossless compression, no matter what resolution it is. Um, that that's the change. Um, there is no other change related to lossless compression. Uh, that's not how lossless JPEG 2000 works. Uh, it's just progressive streaming with... Um... Oh, heck. You know what? I don't know how it works. You might be right. <laughs> I forgot that it's all wavelet based, so I don't I'm not exactly sure how they get to lost this. Right. Uh but since it's wavelet compression, like the amount of data that it takes is very difficult to predict. Uh I, and I'm not exactly sure how I'm not exactly sure what the distribution is. I, I did some A-B tests to see like how much bigger the textures got, and yeah, they got bigger, but the compression ratio was still very good. Uh, but I didn't look at um, if there was a difference in distribution and MIP levels, like if, if all the extra bytes were put in the highest MIP or what. Uh, and it should be noted that the level of texture compression has absolutely nothing to do with VRAM usage. Um, it only has to do with bandwidth and cache size. Yeah, and, and the compression ratio is still like oh, I can't remember. It was like it was like over four to four to one. Um, but I can't remember the exact number. I remember JPEG two thousand with lossless was still better than um, lossy uh, other formats. Uh, I'd honestly be surprised if it makes a difference because at that point I think the latency outstrips the bandwidth uh, when you're where when you're at a 256 or lower. Um, but all else being equal, um, lossless will use more bandwidth, but it will use exactly the same amount of memory, except for you know during the quarter second while it's loading.
or is it the other way around because it's using more bandwidth? Yeah, it's slightly slower if you use lossless uh, because it, it's going to use more bandwidth. Um, and, and to be clear, we're talking about like uh, a difference in size of around 100 kilobytes. All right, so not much. And, you know, since it's wavelet compression, that, that will vary um, depending on what's actually in the image. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not zero, and it, it does add up. Um, so I, I couldn't really discern any benefit to using lossless on most base color maps or on the occlusion roughness map, uh, but on the normal maps, there was a huge win uh, in terms of visual quality, like to the point where content that was using normal maps that were encoded without lossless compression looked straight up broken. Um, like like ANSI art levels of broken. For y'all who were into BBSs back in the day. I remember Wildcat. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. MSI. Those are the days, eh? Yeah, and the cost-benefit on protecting against lossless texture uploads versus adding an asset type. Um, it, it's not cheap to add and maintain another asset type. Uh, you'd, you'd quickly get upside down on any kind of cost savings. Especially because, you know, the, the numbers, should have kept more notes, but uh, the numbers that you're talking about with multi versus lossless and uh, the number of textures that are likely to uh, get uploaded this way. Yeah. Um, now, if it becomes an exploit and everybody is out there uploading lossless and we see a spike in S3 data usage, then I'll have been wrong and Beck will have been right and Beck will get to sing the, the, the song of her people. Um, But and, and I'd like if I wrote down like five exploits that exist in Second Life today, that that would be probably number four uh, on the list of things that I'd want to fix first. If you know what I mean. Yeah, and again, it's not a it's not a VRAM hit. If it's a VRAM hit, then yeah, that's that's totally different calculus. Uh, but it's a bandwidth hit. It's not a system memory hit either. Um, 
the actual JPEG data is only in memory for as long as it takes to uh, decode it. Right, and, and the answer to that problem is uh, smarter, more proactive uh, texture memory management. Um, it's getting better with the GLTF viewer. Um, I think we still have a ways to go before we catch up to what uh, exists in Firestorm and other TVVs. Um, but it's still missing uh, main thing that, that the texture streaming system is missing. And if anybody wants to put together a contribution that that uses the uh, that puts the Firestorm streaming or other TBV streaming that from what I've heard is better than ours um, you know, get that into a PR that would be great um, but if, if not then probably somewhere between here and Vulcan uh, someone will have to go in and make that system a little bit smarter about preemptively discarding instead of waiting until it you run out of VRAM to just frantically discard anything and everything. Is that run on a Chromebook? I'm having a hard time placing the uh, vertical taskbar on the left. Ah, okay. Cool. Yeah, that's one of the things that gets you with um, Android is the memory synchronization. Right. It's like everything is falling out. Is Sorry, I talked over you. What? What I really have here is kind of a technical tour de force. I wanted to an answer the question, is it possible to do Second Life at AAA title speed and quality? And the answer is definitively yes, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. The answer is, is definitely yes. Um, there's, a ago, of, there's a people, lot of... Two years ago, people said that was impossible. And now I've demoed enough stuff that everybody agrees that it's possible. And a lot of the stuff you're putting in the main viewers 
uh, such as um, one pixel per pixel texture loading and uh, re and adjusting the order of texture loading as the avatar moves around and so and multi-threading is stuff that I've done already and so pretty much uh, what I'm doing is painfully bleeding edge but it's interesting to see what's possible um, It's not ready for prime time, sorry. <laughs> One level of control you have in a in a you know, triple A game that you don't have in Second Life is that you control how many triangles are in a scene and you know, we, we don't really have that same level of control. I don't I don't know if you're you know, thinking in terms of like some sort of decimation support or if you're targeting, uh, you know, you want to get a good frame rate for some, you know, definition of what a reasonable scene is, or? Actually, within the limits of the number of frames you're allowed in a scene, this is, 60 FPS is really not all that hard with Vulcan and a modern GPU and, and, and multi-threading. Um, now, clothing is going to be a problem because that doesn't have the, the limitations that prims do. And that's why you hear me at the creator meeting plugging for some kind of processing that takes place at the moment you get dressed to do some optimization. Right. And we kind of we kind of rely on imposters for most of that um, right now. Uh, and, and you're correct that that uh, some kind of a you know the moment that you're that you've set your outfit well. Then your avatar's mid LED and lower becomes like what what Simply Gone calls a proxy LOD, um, where it's just it's not even the same model anymore. It's just a a, a remeshing that looks the same, um, but all the hidden surfaces are removed and everything's combined down to one material. Um, I think we'll get there. Uh, I think we have to get there at some point. Uh, but I think there are steps between here and there. Um, but it's hard, not because it's user-created content, but because the way Second Life works is that textures and meshes are so independent that nothing that does any optimization sees them both at the same time until the moment when the avatar finally gets dressed. Yeah, yeah, and and, and there's no clear delineation between like I'm in world and interacting with my avatar and other avatars and I am dressed and ready to be baked into <laughs> an unoptimized mesh um, there are a couple places where you could put it um, but no matter which way you pick there's content that like slips through a, a, an assumption Right, right. If you had baking of mesh, like baking on mesh, then all the people who have clothes for stripping would complain because they would have to go through a full rebake cycle every time they took something off. Right, and that's where you kind of build it on top of the imposter system, um, where you know your high LOD is your avatar as you see it today, um, but you only see that high LOD for two or three avatars at a time. Um, but then you make the imposter system detailed enough that you don't get that popping that we get today when, when somebody becomes a billboard or imposter. Right, that's what I've come around to thinking. Something like a baked lower LOD imposter is, is needed. We have imposters now, but it's not really very good. Right, right. Clothing that changes on a timer with a HUD is is a real problem. Um, one thing that gets me in my system is if you have a prim, which is changing shape, not just size, it has to go through a whole rebuild the mesh cycle, which is which is rather slow. It's not happening in the main thread, but it still has to happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm kind of curious about that because I've been thinking about doing Vulcan um, and redoing how we do and mesh instancing to not bake out all the transforms and uh, do something with the compute shader to slam all the transforms into a resource buffer uh, so you still end up with one matrix transform per vertex um, then have another compute shader that actually builds the command buffer uh, because it, it seems like because yeah, it oh, seems like uh, that like you get it to where um, you just have a couple couple compute shaders, one for updating the transforms, one for updating the, the command buffer, and then um, and the only input to them would be a camera transform. The rest would just happen on the GPU. Um, but yeah, so still trying to plan that out. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure that's necessary. What I'm basically doing, in, in my world, everything is ultimately a mesh. And trims go through something which generates a mesh, and that goes to the GPU as, as a mesh. If you change something that forces a um, change in the mesh, the whole mesh has to be regenerated, but that is done on another thread, not in the refresh thread. And it is possible for there to be delays because that, that, that may take a while. So you can actually do this even with uh, not too much um, compute work in the, in the GPU. Um, I also have to do that for um, planar texture projection, where I have to break down the mesh into sections viewed from different directions to get the, the uh, planar mapping correct. So there's a certain amount of mesh munging that goes on, but it's, uh, it's, it's mesh munging done once. Yeah, it looks like we've changed topics. Uh... So you're thinking something sort of outside the content creators or TPV existing meetings? I mean, we could just have a TPV meeting one week that's explicitly flagged for discussion of this topic, too. I was mentioning content creators because that's one place it comes up all the time. But I mean, yeah, you're certainly right there. What do you think about uh, just using this meeting one week to talk about it? Is it not really fit there either? Yeah, I'm really curious to, to hear what ideas people have. I I think both voices are very important. I mean, on our side, we're definitely going to want to have, uh, you know, product folks involved in these kind of discussions, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot of it has to do with with dev challenges. Also, kind of curious, like, sure, it costs $50 to, to get uh, a, a decent avatar. Um, I'm curious to hear from the people who make the content why it costs $50.
I I don't follow. I mean, I know that the starter avatar is pointless. Um, that's kind of... Well. Um, I'm curious as to, to what's going on in the clothing market where it costs so much to uh, outfit a, uh, a good-looking mesh avatar. Can I interject on that and just say that there's a lot of people who make bodies who will give you a demonstration one to put in your freebie store and they'll give you lots of complimentary clothing. You can have some pretty decent avatars costing nothing. But you, you sort of have to do the legwork and, and, you know, explain your needs and things and how it will help their brand and it's all, it's all about persuasion, isn't it? Yeah, so that's so, interesting, what, what Coffee said. Um, and that, that's one of the things that's, that's interesting, is that you have these bodies that cost so much, but then the actual clothing is cheap. So how many people... I mean, obviously there's a lot of different reasons that somebody who first signs up might not stick around. Um, you know, expensive uh, expensive avatars could be one of the deterrents. Um, do we have any even kind of anecdotal evidence about that as opposed to, you know, it, it seems to be the first thing people run into is just sort of figuring out, you know, where are they going to go, what are they going to do, how are they going to find, you know, people that they connect with. Um, so, you know, those, those are obviously hurdles. Um, I don't know what fraction of people are getting scared off by, you know, can't afford to look good, um, but it's uh, it's certainly a, an interesting question. We don't we don't get that we, because we have a free store and we do canvas all the makers for donations and stuff. What we get is people who say, I've got a gaming machine and it's it's 10 years old. So we're thinking, oh, my God, but I've got a gaming machine and this runs like rubbish. And that is the biggest problem. Everyone's got old kit. It wouldn't surprise me at all if, if you see different results with different viewers because they're often targeting different audiences. Um, yeah. But uh, certainly which, performance which is, what is another thing. And, you know, there's a lot of pretty basic hardware out there. And so performance on, on those kinds of machines is, uh, is certainly a factor for at least some people. We do know retention is significantly lower for people who you know, show up with, with hardware with low frame rates, which, you know, doesn't prove a causal effect, but it's, uh, you know, suggestive. Yeah, and performance is one of those strange ones where um, to some people it matters a lot, and to some people it doesn't matter at all. Um, and I, I kind of suspect the same thing's true about avatar appearance um, I've got data on one but not the other yeah so gaming PCs are kind of an odd duck right like um, a 10 year old gaming PC is still doing pretty good on uh, on games that are coming out. 
Yeah, my PC is obsolete on the GPU a lot faster than anything else. The, you know, CPUs aren't advancing nearly as fast as they used to. Yeah, and um, and so if you've had an experience on your computer where you were getting great performance and things look good, and then you have an experience later where things don't look good and they don't run well, you're not going to blame your hardware. I get, it's totally rational, I get it. Um, so those are kind of the hardest customers, because the, the folks who come in with non-gaming laptops, they don't care. They're, they've, they're, they're used to not getting good performance. Um, but the folks who come in with like the gaming PCs that have seen what their machine is capable of and then we're not doing it, they seem to care more about performance. <laughs> You're, you're, you're totally right there, and they're they're actually quite defensive about their PC. So if you say, "Well, it's actually a bit old," you can cause mass offence. And uh, so it's it's all about updating drivers and turning bits off you don't need and that sort of thing. Yeah, and and you can go out of your way and you can make it run well. And depending on where you go in SL, it'll run okay. But but to Joe's point. Um, it's still very clear looking at the profiles in the viewer that it's not running as well as it could. Um, and like as a developer that works on the viewer, I have a really hard time blaming people's hardware until I've done everything I possibly can to make it run as well as it can. And we just haven't yet. But we're some, definitely working on it. That, okay, something, something that would help everybody is the ability in a region to actually a region that's not using water to turn it off because it still draws it in and it still drops the frames so if you could actually turn it off in the in the about land that would improve oh uh water got a performance boost and the in gltf viewer um I'd, I'd have to look at where it sits in the hierarchy of um how much time per frame it takes but it shouldn't be giving you a hit anymore Yeah, water was doing some very not smart things, and, that, and that's exactly the kind of thing I'm that I'm thinking of when it's like, well, I can't really blame your hardware for not being able to run to the water uh, because the water is not optimized as much as it should be. The trick on a private island, of course, is to lower it by a hundred, but if the if the draw distance is one twenty eight or something, they'll still draw it in. Yeah, I just ran the frame profiler on the water shader and it is now 3% of the GPU time. And it's not doing any of the things that it was doing before to um, feed its reflection maps. Yeah, some of the retention rows are FPS based. Like, uh, this is the thing about retention, it's no one thing. Um, so if you try to come into the conversation about retention with, well, it's not that, it's not that, it's like, well, it is sometimes. What else is it? Yeah, and, and it, it's it's one of those things, like, uh, I think it was H gave this analogy. Uh, one of the things they learned, I think it was World War II, uh, these planes were coming back, the... Uh, all, all shot up and people looked at the bullet holes and they thought, oh, well, we really need to patch like armor more where those bullet holes are. And it turns out, no, you don't. You patch where the bullet holes aren't because where they aren't is where the planes got hit and they didn't come back. And we see a lot of that in SO. It's like, you know, people complain about this, but they're still here. Well, yeah, some people complain, they're still here. Some people don't complain at all, and they just leave.
Thank you for the anecdotal evidence, Beck. Um, it's nice to know that she wasn't on our viewer because ours is world stop and they make my avatar, but I do get what you're saying. There should be a button for it. Assuming it was Firestorm she was on. All right, well, we're about at time. I'm going to have to run off uh, uh, to uh, to another meeting soon. A um, uh, good suggestion about trying to get some dialogue going. I'm happy to have the new user discussion at you know one or more instances of this meeting, um, or set up uh, set up separate meetings if that's if that works better. Um, maybe I'll. Uh, I'll try just having a designated uh, topic for for the next meeting here for starters, um, and then we'll uh, uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, we can always have more or uh, break it out to its own meeting if there's enough interest. Anyway, thanks for coming by, everybody, and have a good weekend. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks, folks. I, I am off to the boozer who's coming. Going directly there or what? I am. Yeah, it's getting late. I'll see yeah, you there then, yeah? Time to go there. Cheers, everyone. See you next time.